Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. If you treat your people like crap, they will produce crap. <laughs> and if you treat your people well, they will treat, they will, they will reciprocate. Who is Jim Benson? How did you? <laughs> this one gets people, but. Uh... <laughs> uh, well, yeah, Jim Benson has been many different people throughout the course of his life. <laughs> yeah. I, I was an angry punk rocker for a while. Uh, I was an urban planner. Uh, I was an AIDS activist. Um, I, I ran uh, the AIDS Memorial Quilt, the Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt for the Northwest region of the US for like 12 years. Um, I've owned a software company, uh, uh, part, of, part of the team, I guess, that invented Kanban and then took that on to personal Kanban and Lean Coffee. And in a nutshell, all of those things is that Jim Benson is a person who believes that people do their best work when working with others, mm -hmm. that collaboration is the shortest path to success, and that we need to build built environments, systems, visual controls, things like that, agreements uh, that make collaboration more natural and uh, less an avenue for blaming other people when things don't happen. <laughs> That's awesome. And you, you, I, I was trying to like uh, do a little bit of uh, background research and I saw that you were a transportation engineer and you quit your job and started a software company. I was like, what was he thinking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so what that come about? Well, so what happened was um, years ago when I was an engineer, uh, I, I worked with a guy named William Rowden and he was the person I started my software company with. And we worked for a company called David Evans and Associates. And that was probably one of the best companies anyone could work for at all. And they were great because they had a motto that they kind of stuck to, which is we find outstanding professionals and we give them the tools they need to do an outstanding job. So you know, this was like the late 80s, early 90s, and we had unlimited vacation days, you know, all those great things that tech invented. We, we had that before there was tech. <laughs> and, and, and William and I, we worked in a field that was called ITS or Intelligent Transportation Systems. And it was right at the birth of where information technology met, met transportation. And so we, we did the very first real-time traffic website mm -hmm. at, for the Washington Department of Transportation here. Uh, and then later with our software company, we did the very first GIS based real time traffic website for the San Francisco uh, or for the Bay Area Council of Governments. And um, that was called 511.org. And it was the first GIS based system. So when you go use Google, Google Maps now, yeah, that's yeah. based on tech that we kind of pioneered. And no, they didn't pay us for it. <laughs> <laughs> but um but we started we we moved from one to the other because we ended up by kind of as a fluke getting a couple of coding projects mm -hmm. and we were trying to figure out how are we going to fit these coding projects into what we're already doing and we were introduced to this guy who had just written this book and his name was kent beck <laughs> and so we started off you know in xp uh doing agile stuff uh in xp before Agile, I think even had a name yet. I think mm -hmm. that it was just XP. <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah, so it was, it was a really fortuitous moment because we were used to building things like subways mm -hmm. that took 30 years to build. <laughs> and all of a sudden we built this like software in two weeks and we're like, we were like drunk with power at that point. We're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> we can have like immediate impact. That's crazy. And so we liked it so much that we went off and started Gray Hill Solutions. What, what role did you uh, play in David Anderson's Blue Book? Because uh, um, somebody <laughs> told me that that happened through just lean coffees at the Cocoa 
um, place in Seattle? No, no. Lean Coffee came well after we started Kanban. Uh, in what ways did you influence or did you influence David's book? And So uh, Dave and I used to spend a lot of time together. <laughs> and uh, we spent a lot of time in various pubs drinking uh, scotch and talking about our relationships and Agile. And one of the things we talked about most was, you know, he had written Agile Management which has a lot of great stuff in it, but is very, very difficult to implement. Mm -hmm. And so we kept talking about ways to implement that. And just over here in the ladies pub uh, in front of the fireplace <laughs> was where we first kind of drew the first, the first Kanban-y idea. Mm -hmm. And my background is psychology and engineering and kind of collaborative systems. And Dave is in you know, big business, you know, making big projects happen. And so we both went off into our respective offices and implemented the thing on that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So David and uh, Dragosh and others at, and Corey Lattice uh, started building uh, in the XIT project, kind of that, that uh, version of Kanban. And in my office, we were building more of the, the personal Kanban, small teams, high degree of variation um, uh, approach. So it's very much, very much a symbiotic creation. Uh, Dave then went off to do the work that he did at Corbis. And then after Corbis, he came over and we started modus cooperandi together. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we, we developed this logo together. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we did that for a little while, but it, it kind of became clear that, that our, our visions for what our individual visions of Kanban were, weren't they were aligned, but they weren't the same. And so we went off and, you know, did our own, our own separate things. Nice. And uh, maybe just to come back to systems and psychology a little bit, uh, you know, people define systems differently, you know, the, and there are a lot of different systems, but, uh, you, you know, I think what we a lot of times forget is the human side of the systems or human mm -hmm. systems. Um, I spoke with David actually uh, maybe a month ago now, and you know uh, the way that he uh, was emphasizing how much we need to know, understand social systems and how we interact as humans within those systems uh, mm -hmm. was really refreshing because I never heard David talk about that before, and I think you know that's something as an agile lean community we don't spend a lot of time talking Not about. At all. Uh, you know, psychology, and I think I heard you somewhere say, it's not the psychology where you're, you know, treating patients, but more like a, just understanding humans and how we think, what motivates us, um, you know, what's important to us, and then also how we interact in a social environment. Mm -hmm. What are you, what are your thoughts? I mean, when it comes to, you have background this, uh, what do most professionals and companies get wrong about the, the, the human systems side? Wow. Um, we've been taught for over a hundred years that we need to pay attention to policy, procedure, and um, uh, that if we do those things, then the humans will just do what we tell them to. <laughs> and um, one of the things that I you know, when, when everybody was talking about scrum, butt, mm -hmm. I was saying all scrum teams are scrum, butt, and they would get upset about that. And I would be like, if you take any scrum team and you remove two people from it and you move two new people on, does the team change? And they're like, well, of course it does. Scrum, butt. <laughs> <laughs> something different is happening because the individuals that are gathered to work together form their own, their own culture. So I want to make sure that people actually understand that, that, yes, we're trying to get like flow of tickets through a Kanban, but we're also trying to get psychological flow, which is I'm, I'm comfortable with the work that I'm getting. I feel protected by the system that I'm in. I feel like the system is exciting enough that I can change it in helpful ways. When somebody else has a problem, I know when I can help and when I can't. Uh, that those things give you professional comfort and we don't design for those. 
in fact, we usually design for the opposite. We design for stopping people from exercising their professional judgment. Not you're from, there's yeah. a there's a tight correlation between I think you've I've heard you say before clarity and flow. Could you maybe elaborate on that? What you yeah. mean by clarity and flow? Yeah. And clarity doesn't mean that everything is defined. It means that we just understand how everything is. So in in agile or in software development in general, there are a lot of things that are very standard that we can say every day these things are going to happen or each time I touch this, this is going to happen or, you know, this is part of our, uh, you know, our racks and in our racks, we're always going to have things very standardized and then we're going to have things that are very complex mm -hmm. because that's what we do for a living. We solve weird problems. Wicked problems. Yes, wicked, wicked problems. <laughs> wicked, wicked, weird problems. <laughs> And the, the problem is that we spend a lot of time inventing wicked problems because we don't take any time to say, this is what our standard work is. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the stuff we know. Let's just set that up so that it's, it'll be stable. Then when something weird happens, we will have the cognitive bandwidth to be able to, to deal with it. And when it comes up and it says, you know, hey, I'm just presenting myself, I'm a new weird thing. Do we have a set of procedures to effectively deal with the weird thing? Like if you come up against a complex problem, do you always have more than three people who are going to work on solving it? Because mm -hmm. individuals can't solve complex problems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when those come up and they reach a certain level of danger, who else needs to be involved? And what you're saying is like, we just got to start thinking, right? we have to start valuing each other yeah. <laughs> we have to, yeah recognize that like th these these walking flawed globs of of water and goo in our heads those are the things that actually write the code mm -hmm. you know it's not jira and it's not you know github <laughs> writing the code <laughs> we're writing the code and if we set up a system like, like you, know, who, you know, who found out this better than electronic arts? If you treat your people like crap, they will produce crap. <laughs> and if you treat your people well, they will treat, they will, they will reciprocate. So how do we intentionally wake up in the morning and say, we're gonna set up a system that has, maybe it has a Kanban in it. Uh, we, we tend to have like five or six visual controls probably for any given project that we're working on. So Kanban is like the entry level to an effective team. It's not the marker of an effective team. Mm -hmm. And those other visual controls are based on what information do the professionals on that team need in order to do a good job, you know, right now. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, you know, in a sense, like uh, a lot of that is, uh, the reason that I said we gotta start thinking because like there's a lot of, uh, you know, focus on Scrum, focus on, and, you know, just name a framework. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen, at least in reality, is that we got to start using our heads. We got to start, we can't rely mm -hmm. just on framework. And I think, you know, when you say we got to minimize the variance or understand what the standard work is, and that doesn't imply necessarily, you know, uh, apply, uh, you know, a famous or uh, a framework no. that's, but it's more like we got to understand our work and we got to understand what type of work it is mm -hmm. based on the type of work treated differently. If you have a lot of certainty, don't overcomplicate it, you know, create processes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that um, when I'm, when I'm working like in construction or healthcare or something outside of uh, software and they say that they, they want to be agile, and then I say, well, you know, do you want to do Scrum or do you want to do XP or do you want to do less or do you want to do that or do you want to do safe or do you? <laughs> and I'll just sit there and, and list like 12 frameworks. And they're like, and I was like, yeah. So exactly. that's what agile means to me, utter chaos. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can we take a step back and find out like what is bothering the professionals on your team and in the ecosystem that your team interacts with? And then can we start to remove the impediments that they're facing on a daily basis to get work done? Mm -hmm. 
And um, it would be easy to dump that into the bucket of lean, but, but lean also doesn't go far enough in dealing with those relationships. And it's a shame because Lean always, re, 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 you know, tries to relate itself back to Toyota. Mm -hmm. But Toyota's big thing wasn't, you know, an Andon cord or stopping the line or having a Kanban even. Toyota's big thing was building better relationships with their supply chain. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. <laughs> exactly. And, but it was also, I think, people. Like, I think the way that Lean and uh, it was interpreted in the West is... Uh, different than how Toyota and East, you know, there was a lot more focus on people and relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to the culture, um, which I'm interested, like, how do you define culture? I haven't heard you. Uh, what, what, what is culture to you? Well, what we say is that individuals in teams create value. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's kind of the operational system. And the culture is the needs of the people on those teams to that where satisfying those needs allow them to behave as responsible professionals. Mm -hmm. So they can make decisions when they need to. Again, they can help when they need to. So it's one of the biggest things that kills any company is they put barriers up for people helping other people. Mm -hmm. Then someone needed help, they didn't get it. They blame the other people. So what we tend to define as culture is often kind of the failure state of culture. <laughs> you know, like we have an we have an accountability culture here, or we have a you know a, you know big carrot and stick culture. Um, but what we do talk about that because I think that's another important point that, that I've heard you made recently, and you may have said, but like high performing teams move from accountability to responsibility. Yes. And when you said that, that, that was like, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, could you elaborate I, on that? I get a lot of flack for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, I feel like a, like a bomber in world war II. you know, flies, like, you know, all these things flying. The a uh, lot of things that I think, you know, uh, 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 that I want to bring up that probably feel that way. Too, but, um, it resonated so, with me. It resonated with so, me. So. so, so accountability is generally a failure state. It's generally a failure demand model where you're setting up expectations of people and then you are preparing to hold them accountable when it doesn't go right. Rather than setting up a system from the beginning that says, as a group, here are our goals. You know, these different people uh, might be taking the lead on this thing or, or this other thing, but all of us are responsible for making sure that we get to that end state safely. Mm -hmm. So that when you're, you know, you're, if you're on a Kanban, your swim lanes uh, and, and you're, you're swimming along and someone down here starts drowning, you can go save them. <laughs> you don't have to like, I'm sorry, I got a deadline, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so and, think about, yeah. So w how do then, I mean, I, I got a couple of questions, I guess, but mm -hmm. to, to elaborate on this. Um, so if, I, I agree. It's like, uh, accountability is like cover my ass, uh, yep. responsibility is like, uh, do the right thing. Maybe. Yep. Right. That's it. That's exactly it. The, uh, that, uh, the one thing that I learned at David Evans and Associates was that, that professionalism didn't mean I do my work. Mm -hmm. Professionalism was I make the world better for my customers, for my colleagues and for myself. But mm -hmm. if you skip any of those, you're in trouble. And so when we build systems that say things like the scrum master protects the team from management or demands by the client, mm -hmm. in instant fail. 100% instant fail. <laughs> so the, the latest scrum guide 2020 has moved to accountabilities. Yep. So is, I'll is catch, they're, 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 always, they're always catching up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, but so, I mean, they got crap even from Ron Jeffries about that last yeah, week. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think about the the, the commercialization of agile? And you know, I'm a CST. I train, and uh, 
Um, you know, it's a usually two day course. People are coming for certifications. And uh, I don't know, I was listening to one of your podcasts and the way that you set up your trainings. And one of the things uh, that you said uh, that resonated with me, and uh, I tend to like those longer spread out classes is that you mm -hmm. can't just jam things into two days. So you purposely have designed some of your courses that are months long. Yeah, just for four, four, four months. months. <laughs> what is it, four months? Yes. Yeah, and it's like yeah. I call it like marinating, right? You want these yeah. ideas and these concepts to marinate in your head, and uh, the the whole agile has moved towards that kind instant of instant gratification. Yeah. So, is that going to stick around? Probably. <laughs> uh, oh, you mean the instant gratification? It's yeah, gratification. it's human nature. Yeah. <laughs> So, so right now, universities are having a problem because people are like, you mean I have to go to school for months? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, because you got to think. Mm -hmm. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're so used to, you know, uh, oh, my God, this is bothering me. In five minutes, I want it to no longer bother me. Uh, and then we wonder how we get things like, you know, current issues that we have with social media platforms mm -hmm. um, is, is we don't take the time to really think about the ramifications of what we're building. So where are we headed? I mean, in a sense, like, uh, I know we, we can foretell future, but like all the signs are saying, in a sense, like there's more demand for quick wins there's more demand for these uh you know two-day certification classes um i'm not getting even though i've run you know month long for instance uh csm you know the mm -hmm. demand is just not there nobody wants to uh take that approach that you're uh you, you've described as well where it's like four month process mm -hmm. um in a cohort type of style where you're actually learning with others you're putting things into practice and yep. As humans, that's how we a lot of times learn. And it seems like the whole human side of things is still getting shoved to the side. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a big thing in, in our visual management certification. And it, it, it catches students off guard. Mm -hmm. So you'll go through the first section, which kind of just uses personal Kanban to just kind of say, this is what a system might look like. But immediately upon getting into the second section, that's about interactions. Mm -hmm. The things that we claim to do in Agile. <laughs> We're really good at the individuals. <laughs> we kind of suck at the interactions. And, and uh, so um, one of the, one of the uh, homework assignments in that, and this is like, it's a serious like gut punch to tech people <laughs> is because, and this is an assignment that I had. It was like, it was, it, it was literally something from, from my past. Um, which we take the town of Albion, Michigan, which is a town that has a little little university and a little college in it, but it's been it, it's been dwindling in population since the 1950s, and uh, people have been very good at you know complaining about it, yeah. and so we say, okay, you're going to have a public meeting, you're going to have the city, and you're going to have the college. They don't get along, uh, and you need to figure out a way to bring helpful industry or helpful business into the city and uh, we talk we tell them about some different types of endogenous and exogenous growth uh you know uh, some uh some some uh economic theories that are quite outside of of agile and lean and we say your job is to bring these people together and design a meeting that will that will achieve consensus and a lot of people have a lot of heart, a lot of problem with that because it's something they're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. But I was talking to one of my agile coach friends the other day, and he was like, um, uh, um, "The other day, you know, we thought we, we thought our company was super awesome, and then all of a sudden we had all of these complaints lined up against us about microaggressions." And I'm like, "Really?" Did they did they teach you about that in your CSM? <laughs> so, so what I want people to get out of our classes is, yes, you know, here's how you can visualize work. Here's how you can visualize conversations. Here's how you can visualize outcomes. But it's so that you can deal with situations like that. Mm -hmm. 
like real life stuff. Coding is not real life. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that goes around the coding is. My bosses are being jerks. We got three quarters of the way through this project and we were derailed. Uh, the, 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 uh, the guy on the board of directors whose pet project this was had a heart attack last night and all the other people on the board of directors hate him. You know, <laughs> weird stuff like that happens. Yeah. That's what we need to be ready to deal with. And if we are, the coding stuff is easy. But that's, that's not, so that's my concern. Right. Uh, there are not that many people. If you look at the interest and then if you look at like, you know, the classes out there, not many, not much is being discussed in the agile and lean circles about exactly what you said. It's more like, oh, go learn about, you know, uh, safe and running trains, go learn about Scrum Master role and how to become mm -hmm. a Scrum Master. But nobody's really depicting and understanding what's underneath all of that. The human well, and even when they try, they do the same thing. So it's like, I'm going to go off and I'm going to get a two day, uh, a two day, I'm going to take a two day course and get a certification in uh, psychological safety. And it's like, um, psychological safety is really, really deep. <laughs> and if you get a two day course in it, you just paid for a two day course in making yourself feel better about psychological safety. <laughs> but what you're not doing is sitting around saying, wow, like I'm gonna take a whole day and think about times where I've totally messed up someone else's psychological safety. Okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna own that. <laughs> but, that but that requires, uh, you know, that requires uh, self-awareness that requires, mm -hmm. you know, and I just, you know, my point around this is that we know that that's important, but we don't put as an industry, you know, a lot of no. leaders that I talk to, but the money is in, in, in the quick yeah. stuff. So, so there's a reason why Modus Institute and Modus Cooperandi do not have 700 employees. Uh, so we designed the Lean Agile Visual Management program to attract people who would want to be in the program. And I was really worried that if we set up a two-day certification in anything, I would become incredibly wealthy and no one would get any value for it, but they would think they did. And that would not make me feel good. <laughs> Well, that's, that's the thing. So how does it, how, you know, so what are you finding out? Like, cause I agree. It's, it's, it's like, it feel it makes you feel good. You know, that maybe like you said, you, you're making more money, you get it and you certify more people, but it probably feels a lot more better to understand that you equip equipping people to actually deal with real problems and yes. it's probably coming back. So like, what are some of the things that you're seeing that, the, you know, that when people come back to you, and uh, I'm sure there's mm. some stories, and uh, uh, that must so, be so, real good uh, in, in a sense that. So there's two things. Right? Yeah, there's two things about that. First, is that there's a lot of really good people in the agile world. <laughs> so I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to make it because because I often I, I often state things too bluntly. And then I am taken as like guy that hates all the people, but talks about how nice people should be. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the system that we've set up is not allowing the agile community to have the right conversations because they're chasing, you know, their next, their, you know, their safe, you know, level 72, you know, certification. <laughs> Yeah, safe is pretty much up with the with the masons now. Uh, the, there's there's enough levels in there, I think. Um, but uh, you've got good people at the Scrum Alliance. We're trying really hard, like really, really hard, to fix some of these systemic issues. And uh, and I want to acknowledge that because, like I said, I, I always end up painting myself into that corner. So what I found is uh, also is that whether it's people coming to us for new work or people returning after years or people that we didn't ever know were using our stuff who then show up and like say we're doing these things is that it's been incredibly gratifying that from 
new hires, actually, we'll just we'll say like from university to new hires, to people who have been in for a while to upper management, there is a strong realization that, that the problems that we're seeing across the board in business are due to an inability to effectively work with other people. Uh, they're not due to how fast you fail. <laughs> they're, they're not due to how, you know, how many thousands of experiments you run or even how many times you pull the and on cord. It's, do I understand how the individuals in my group are working with the other people to provide value? And when I get a call from like, you know, say somebody my age, so somebody like in their, in their mid fifties, who has worked in, um, uh, like there's a company that we're working with that we worked with that makes tents. <laughs> so like they literally have, they make big, huge, gigantic tents. And when the leadership called up and said, you know, we, we understand that in order to make better tents, we have to treat each other better. And we have 75 years or whatever it was of experience of not treating people better. You know, we're not horrible, but we're not, we're not making the extra effort. Um, when people lead with that, I get hopeful. <laughs> I get really super, super hopeful. I mean, it is, it is definitely like, uh, if you don't have that, like, you, you know, the numbers, you know, people are disengaged, they're disconnected from the work, and there's no way that you can innovate or that you can do good work when you're disengaged. Uh, mm -hmm. When I've been disengaged, I'm thinking about other stuff that I want to do that I feel like... Uh, is more gratifying than mm -hmm. where I might be working on, right? Then mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people feel that way too. And uh, it, it's uh, it's interesting that human side of things that uh, uh, the, that, like you said, is the trickiest. You can do all this other stuff, but um, maybe to like something that you said that uh, I want to come back to is, is that human side and like. Uh, you know, a lot of times we have a hard time saying like, you know, uh, developers should talk to the customers. You know, a lot of times I go to the leaders and say, <laughs> developers should be uh, talking to the customers and get closer to the customer. And they're like, hell no, are you crazy, Milan? You want, yeah. our, developers, you, you want our weed developers to talk to uh, customers? And then you talk to developers and they're like, no, leave me alone. I don't want That's to exactly <laughs> I'll give you the the I'll give you the best the best example of that, that I ever saw it was uh, we did work for a um, for a part of the Washington State government that handles most of the social services in the state, and we worked with two teams. One team was working on a, uh, and maintaining a, a old crappy piece of software that managed all of the at risk elderly people in the state. Uh, so people who might be in a home situation where they were being abused or beaten up or locked in a room and their savings were just being spent by their kids or whatever. Uh, and then the other was for kids. So all of the kids that were in the, in the CPS system in the, and, um, I, I said, do you ever go watch what your customers are doing? And he said, yeah, sometimes we'll go and we'll sit with the caseworkers and we'll watch them use the system. And I was like, why do you care about that? And they said, well, you know, we want to see like where they're stumbling and where they have problems with drop down menus and things like that. And I was like, all right, I want you to listen to me very carefully. <laughs> the people that you are meeting when you do that are not your customers. And they're like, but they're the caseworkers or the people who use it. I was like, no, 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 you, you, see, you seem to think that the people that you're meeting are the caseworkers. And by then they're just like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wake up at six o'clock in the morning, already dicey with the software developer. <laughs> I want you to go with your caseworker, meet them for breakfast. And then I want you, and then by then they're already saying no. <laughs> I want you to get in a car with them and I want you to drive around with them for the day. Just one day. And then watch them use your software. 
And so, of course, they meet with the caseworker in the morning. Caseworker's like, hi, isn't it a great day? And then they go get coffee and stuff. And then they'd start meeting with people. And by the end of the day, the caseworker is, is, is just a wreck. Mm-hmm. Because you're literally seeing the worst every hour of how human beings treat other human beings. Mm-hmm. And then you're expected to come in and use a piece of software that looks like it was designed for, for, for Windows XP. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was like a hostile program. So yeah, they could navigate it, but they were dealing with so much crap by that point that all they really wanted, either wanted to do was sleep or find something at the bottom of a bottle. <laughs> And I about killed those poor people. They weren't prepared to know what being a caseworker smells like. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's not just meeting with your customer. It's understanding the reality Mm -hmm. of the people who are using the stuff. And they were really mad at me. But almost instantly, they started making some pretty major UX changes. Mm -hmm that they never would have done otherwise because logically the software worked okay. After that, they were like, what gift can I give to those people? (laughs) Sorry, that was a really long answer, but but it was awesome. (laughs) That was a really good example in the sense of like, you know, we talk a lot about getting closer to the customer. We spend so much time building the wrong things or, you know, we think we confuse being busy with, you know, something that's truly solving the problem or making some- We we, we confuse instrumentation with relationships. (laughs) Mm. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Yes. Jim at moduscooperandi.com if you want to send your hate mail there. <laughs> so maybe let's continue with, uh, continue with this because I, I want to bring up a, something else that I agree with. And, uh, okay. the, you, so you said the basic structure of Agile Manifesto is fundamentally flawed. Yes. So you, you over create a toxic environment. Yes. Could you, this is another one of those things that you might get some hate mail, but. Well, you, so, so what's been that? funny is I, I've been on the, the stalwart stage at Agile, Agile insert year several times. And this one comes up all the time, like every year, I think. And it's because people are struggling with it. So it's not because they hate it, it's because they're struggling with it. And I don't blame the Agile community for this at all, but I think it's snowboard, snowboard, <laughs> at, Sunbird, at Sunbird too, when they went and said, oh, it's fine. And then they went home. Mm-hmm. I was like, you tell people that they need to continuously improve things. And then you went and said, oh, the Agile Manifesto is fine. And then you just went home. Wow, that's some lazy stuff there, guys. <laughs> so, so, so congratulations on that. Uh, the, so yeah, so you have couplets, and like individuals and actions over processes and tools. And the problem is individuals and cannot interact without processes and tools. Mm-hmm. So what that actually reads out as, like honest to God, in, 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 this, is all, this is a full on Jim Benson, Agile heretic here. <laughs> individuals and interactions over processes and tools means people talking without knowing how to talk. Okay, so individuals and actions or interactions through processes and tools, Mm -hmm. that's great. Working code through proper documentation, that's great. (laughs) But what's happened is, and I know that they say the stuff on the left, we believe and the stuff on the right, we just believe the stuff on the left more, total cop out and a total lack of understanding of the syntax of English. <laughs> but it's also, I think it's also uh, uh, the, the way that I see that it's flawed. It's not even English. It, it goes back to the humans, uh, to mm-hmm. the human side of things. Um, and the reason that I think it's flawed is because you're taking that statement of over, right? Mm-hmm. Nothing in a sense like, uh, uh, over is a too strong of a word where there, you know, there are multiple truths, mm-hmm. right? Uh, yeah. I, would, I would say, so yes, and uh, that the, um, that it creates a set of false dichotomies mm-hmm. that people have had major uh, anti-pattern reactions to. Like you go to places and they say, we're not agile, we're agile, therefore we don't document our code. Mm-hmm. And I know that people will say, that's not how it's supposed to happen. Too bad you created the system that is encouraging that behavior. 
So we need to come up with a way to encourage the behavior that we wish to see, which is appropriate professional, you know, professional code with professional documentation. Mm -hmm. Just, just, just that simple. But that's also common sense. And, you know, sometimes that common sense is not the common practice as the saying goes, but uh, it's like, you know, we tend to lean on agile manifesto, lean on these frameworks. And it really goes back to just, I call it just going back to thinking, like, you know, going back to <laughs> using your yep. head and, and figuring out what works for you. And maybe to shift gears a little bit, uh, I want to come back. I, I work with this company in California called uh, uh, Clark Pacific. And mm -hmm. uh, they build, uh, they use Lean and Agile for construction, their construction company. Yep. And given your background, I wanted to maybe spend a little bit of time exploring just what are you seeing in that construction space um, ah. and the clients that you're working with? Uh, what are the challenges that they're facing with? And uh, uh, what common pitfalls are they falling so into? The, the, so the beautiful thing about construction is that it is hundreds of years old and it has, so like, you know, you have like old money and new money. <laughs> if you have like old process and new process, software is all new process. So people are just trying to spend it as quickly as they, po as they possibly can in and, you know, you, you know, by working with Clark that you'll meet people there who have worked there 35 or 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, there, there aren't any tech companies that have been around that long, <laughs> yeah. except like, except Microsoft and Apple, you know, so, uh, so, you know, the, the beauty there is that the misbehaviors of various actors are incredibly known and almost taken for granted. So let's say you've got um, uh, you've got a general contractor. You on, on a project. You've got an architect. You have two structural engineers. You have one uh, environmental engineer. You have uh, fifteen trades, and those are all coming together to spend millions of dollars of somebody's money. Or, or in the case, you know, with me and, it, and probably with your your projects as well, billions of dollars of somebody's money. Uh, so the size of these projects makes startups look like a joke. Uh, and um, every project is kind of given, you know, carte blanche. It's like you can, you can be what you want to be. And the, so what I loved with working with Turner is that they took that seriously. And so when I said, you know, on like this project, I would like to develop a better relationship with the uh, designers and the architects. So that when we're processing paperwork, that paperwork just flows through and it's not a big fight to get stuff done all the time. And I'll save everybody money. It'll save everybody time. But the only thing that we're going to do really is get together and agree not to be jerks. And everybody, of course, said, well, I'm totally willing to do that. But those other jerks aren't. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we got all the jerks in a room, they're like, well, I thought you were the jerk. Oh, and then it was a big hug. <laughs> and. And I love that stuff. I absolutely love that stuff because in that field, you can't hide from who your customer is and you can't hide from the trades because if you do, they're going to fall off a ladder and hurt themselves, literally. So software is like so safe. You know, the only hurt you ever get is your feelings or because you're like, or because you're treated like crap. You know, those are the only the two things, but you very rarely you know, have a rivet go through your skull or something. Yeah. <laughs> Physically, yeah. Almost never happens in, in software. <laughs> but what, what, what was your experience? Well, it's just like understanding, you know, challenges of, uh, of dependencies, right? Challenges mm -hmm. of, of, like you said, relationship and communication and visualizing work. And what's, uh, you know, it's always amazing when people start talking to each other and they start understanding and, you know, develop that relationship. Like you said, it, it, it seems like that human side of things kind of fixes everything else. If we have uh, that trust, if we have those relationships. Um, and I thought it was interesting how Clark Pacific combined, like they didn't necessarily care about Scrum or 
um, or agile or lean. They, they were looking at, you know, just what works for us and how can we help others understand what we're trying to do here, how we're visualizing work, how the work is flowing. That was it. That was that was what made every day at Turner Construction feel like I was going to a, like a business spa. <laughs> <laughs> Is that people people might do things that you wish they didn't do. They might not do things as quickly as you want, but people were just ridiculously practical. Mm-hmm. And uh, and in the end, even though you know I, I like to avoid unnecessary deadlines. When you're building a multi-billion dollar building that already has tenants who are, who are slated to move in and their rent in their current building is two and a half million dollars a month, mm-hmm. there's real penalties for missing the real deadline. Mm-hmm. And so you need to make sure up front that that deadline is, is acceptable, that there are, uh, there are uh, allowances for different complexities and that you have the ability to deal with those complexities as you come up, um, as they come up and that you, you know, they're one of the guys that I work with at Turner, he just did a series of events with, with some of their suppliers. And initially the suppliers were like, all right, you're, you're, you give me millions of dollars worth of business every year. So I'll come to your stupid thing. And then a couple of days into it, they're like, wait, if we do this, can we really do this? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we can really do this. And we want, we want to make sure that you have a safer environment, that you know when other people are going to be on the floor, when, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, and one of the guys said, you know, if we go through a couple projects and, you know, the, all these projects do this and we get into a rhythm, you can bet that our estimates for you are going to come in 20% lower because they instantly could see where the savings were going to come from. Mm -hmm. And and the savings were all relationships. It wasn't like we're going to make the cost of wood lower. It was, we're just going to stop treating you like dirt. (laughs) And that's what I'm seeing too. Like that, uh, uh, that relationship side, that culture side, they're talking about changing that because again, um, Another thing that I'm seeing, um, and I didn't know this till I got into the space a little bit, um, but Lean Construction Institute, uh, yep, LCI, is, yep. is big, and you know they're looking at agile. And then, like I saw Jeff Sutherland and Scrum Inc. Uh, diving into this uh, construction business. God help us all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm like, uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on like, do you think, uh, it, it, you know, as agile is going outside of software development and there is interest in construction to learn about these because they see them as management approaches well no what they have bought is the bullshit arguments that agile actually works for people and and the reason that those arguments persist is because nobody ever actually measures what's really going on so we cherry pick routinely you know, good stories. And then we tell those good stories a lot. And what we're not doing is saying, what are you actually, what does agile actually mean? Like for the love of God, what does this thing mean? Because it doesn't mean two week iterations. Uh, it, it, it doesn't mean small teams. It, it doesn't, it, you know, everything that, that we ever try and give it as a definition, it immediately wiggles out of that definition. So right now, literally the definition for me for agile is good shit. (laughs) And, and, um, I love the drive to do better things and continuous improvement. But, but the malpractice that is, has been perpetuated in the name of, of Agile, you know, that's how we have 737s falling out of the sky. <laughs> yeah, which is and, crazy. And I mean, and like then all the big consulting companies are into this. And, you know, this is not just what, what you're saying. It's not just that false, um, false perception in mm-hmm. the outside of software. It's in software, too. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, we don't know what it means. Uh, yeah. And companies are falling for it. They think, you know, like you said, they, 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 they don't really know what it means, but everybody's doing this. So my company must do it as well. Yep. And so, so the, the, to bring this back to the beginning, uh-huh. 
uh, you'll bring in a coach. The coach has gone through a couple of these certification programs. They've got enough of a resume to say, I've done things for people. No one really checks your history. Um, but, you know, the questions that I would ask a new agile coach were, what's the weirdest problem that you came up that, that, that confronted you and how did you solve it? Uh, how did you deal with it when you got a team working in a comfortable way and somebody else came along and derailed it? Mm -hmm. uh, and to see if the responses to those things are humane or if they're complain. <laughs> well, that, yeah, exactly. And that tells you a lot about that person and their, you know, uh, uh, their state of mind and what they're thinking. Yeah. And, uh, so, so I'll tell you, like, I, like, there are a lot of people that I would trust immediately in the agile world with one of my clients mm -hmm. you know ron ron jeffries and i spar all the time i would totally trust him with one of my clients right. and i guarantee you that if you go back and look through all the clients that ron jeffries has ever had he's never done the same thing twice mm -hmm. he's done what the client has needed and i and i respect the hell out of him for it you know i would i would trust alistair Coburn with any of my clients. Uh, you know, there's 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 a, a long a long list of people that I, that I would trust. Who the would not trust. Oh, I'm not going to say who I would not <laughs> trust, but but what what I would what I what, what makes me untrusting yeah. is the number of people running around claiming to be experts who have never managed anything, have never dealt with a serious interpersonal issue who don't understand the relationships between serious interpersonal relationships or issues and agile or lean or making a better culture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've had to deal with horrible things since we started Modus, mm -hmm. uh, not in our company, but with, with our, with our, with our customers. And, uh, there have, uh, there have been like, uh, sexual assaults, uh, people posting on, on Facebook, I'm going to drive to the office and blow everybody away. And everybody knows that person has a truckload of, of, of guns. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 upper management specifically, specifically laying traps for people so that they can make them look bad to not just fire them, but to ruin their career in the future. Uh, crazy things <laughs> and, uh, or even just simple power dynamics where a company is set up to have like incredible positional power centered in two or three senior vice presidents and everybody else just lives in fear and you're brought in as the coach. How do you create positive change in an organization that is scared to death? How do you, how do you create positive change in an organization that has just been that has just been brought up on charges by the federal government for mishandling the information of the people that subscribe to its service. <laughs> mm. um, you know, your scrum master training isn't going to help you with that. And, it, and, and I'm, I'm just, I'm being all ranty about this because no, you're, you're, that's you're, why people hire us. But it goes back to the, like where we started, and maybe this is a good way to conclude it. It, is, it goes back to the systems, understanding the systems, and not just, you know, I think I spoke with Dave Snowden, and he was shedding all over systems thinking. Yep. Uh, just because I think uh, same way that, uh, you know, we've taken certain things to extreme, we've taken systems thinking to extreme just to mean, uh, you know, one type of systems, like physical yep. systems. or But, like, it's really understanding different types of systems, including as I said, human systems, the human side mm -hmm. of the systems. And I agree, you know, most of the coaches, most of the trainers don't have that experience, can't go in and understand that. Um, the question is, if I had to guess, it, 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 it's very small of people that can do that, mm -hmm. and yet our world is dealing with challenges that require more than that small people, small percentage of people that can do it and yep. uh what i respect about what you're doing and what others uh in the some of the pe other people that are in the, doing in the issues in the industry is creating and helping develop people to understand that broader spectrum mm -hmm. of of the uh, skills and understanding that you need to have to, to do that so maybe as a last kind of thought here is uh what would you uh, what 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 would be your message to 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 people that are inspiring to be those coaches that you described that you would 
like to work with. <laughs> can I can I share my screen? Sure. <laughs> okay. So here I go. I'm gonna quickly share my screen. Um, so uh, this is a, a LinkedIn post that I put up the other day, and I used the LinkedIn post just to make sure that I got the fully redacted version of this. Uh, so Tony Moon and I just did a week long event with one of our larger clients, and um, and we have kind of a a half format. And so I'm showing this to kind of show the half format. It's kind of like a, a ramp, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we got this group together and they're a, a super, a hyper distributed team. No two people on this team are actually in the same city, really. And um, so they're spread all over the world. And, but they have a very pivotal role in, in this large company. And, um, they also kind of work on the uh, that that dividing line between research and development and release. So they have to be able to speak super creative and super buttoned down. Uh, they're a really amazing special group of people. So what we did initially was we got together with them and we did a value stream mapping exercise. And that's what this part is. Mm -hmm. And in that we go through and we say, okay, basically, what is a problem that you're currently set, having, you know, and then we say, okay, what, what is the process behind that? Mm -hmm. And we get together and we know, you know, what happens in the process, what problems are in there, what possible solutions are in there, who you can collaborate with, et cetera, and so forth. And the, we always start with this because it's kind of like calisthenics. <laughs> it's, it's like a warm up exercise. Yeah. but it's super valuable. So in this, you get everybody in, in this mode where they're thinking about things that happen both procedurally and culturally, because no work is handed off without either helping or harming the person that comes after you. So and no work like that you're trying to, it's almost like exposing the system or visualizing the physical system of the value delivering. You're just trying, trying to reflect it back to them, right? 100%, but also to get them to see it because no team ever agrees on what it is. <laughs> and you'll probably ever. say it, the most valuable part of this is the conversation that goes into this, right? T totally, totally. Yeah. It's that and it's getting them ramped up. And then we go into this thing and this thing is what we call the charter. And we do four uh, affinity mapping exercises around vision, which is kind of like, you know, what does the team do? Who do they do it for? What value do they get out of it? Uh, how, do, how are their lives better? And then the next one is expectations. What do we expect from each other of people giving us work, of people that we give work to? Uh, the next one is boundaries or collaboration. How, when do we need to talk to each other? And then the last one is victory, which is like, if we were 100% successful right now, what would that look like? And we go through each of these. In this case, this was Monday, this was Tuesday, this was Wednesday. So we're already halfway into the week and we're supposed to do all these things. <laughs> so then we get into Thursday and I'm like, all right, guys, you know, <laughs> we've really got to turn up the turn up the heat. So we go into the communications agreement, which is what do we need as professionals to know? How do we know it? Where's the information stored? Where do we always have to ask each other? Where do we lose stuff? And we start to build out what the communications agreement for this is so that we can give people this stuff so that we can do this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we didn't get all the way through it. Then when we got to here, it became clear that the team already had what they need to know out of this exercise. And rather than going and doing this next thing, and it doesn't even matter what that thing was, we went and did a second value stream mapping exercise around what their future state was. Mm -hmm. So all right, smart people, <laughs> if everything worked fine, what would that generic thing look like? Because this was a particular thing they did and they did like 20 or 30 particular things. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, what's your particular, you know, what's the genericized version of that that looks perfect? And then after that, we did, this is called the low hanging fruit orchard <laughs> where we create, we basically had them move all of the solutions that were in these previous things down into here. We did a little effort and impact thing, and then we created a roadmap for them to actually do that. And while we were doing that, they were like putting silly pictures in here and doing all of this stuff. And it was filled with their personality. Mm -hmm. But the key here is that our goal originally was to do these nine boxes. And in the end, we did these two and two thirds or two and three quarters. And then after that, all this other stuff is just made up on the fly based on the needs of that team. Why is that important? Well, that's important because 
if you go into your client, to your customers, and you do the same thing every time, mm -hmm. we're going to do stand-up meetings, and we're going to ask, what did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? What do you, and, you know, do you have any blockers? Uh, we're going to do uh, retrospectives every two weeks, and they're going to look like the, this format, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. If you have that script, you helped no one. Mm -hmm. Because they have problems that are independent of software development. Yeah, and like, what, what, I mean, like what, what I saw there, just as you quickly described it, is like, let me help you understand the current state. Let me clear a platform for you to discuss it, better understand it. Let's talk about, you know, uh, you know how we're going to work. What does the future look like, right? In the sense of policies and, you know, what we need mm -hmm. to do as a team. And then let's visualize the future state. Yes, and with that, you're giving him. You know, I'm sure that's not the, the 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 end. Now the hard work starts, which is how do we evolve the system, right? How, how, how do we how do we take the momentum of this really emotional week and make sure that your culture that you've defined here is operationalized? Mm -hmm. It's part of your it's part of your overall obeya. Uh, so um, uh, I know we're probably going long, so I'm going to try and make this super short, but I want to share just really quickly our, you know, the, one of the guys that invented Kanban, mm -hmm. this is their current Kanban. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for this is this is our, our podcast. These are our newsletters. These are our blog posts. This is marketing. This is all the crap that goes into actually building a company. Uh, this down here is one of the courses that needed to be shored up. So at any given point in time, you need to know more stuff than is just going to be on a Kanban. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I say this because I don't want the Agile people to think that I'm just ragging on Agile. I'm, ag I'm, I'm ragging on our current state in software development. <laughs> well, and I agree. And I think most people, at least I agree and why I wanted to speak with you because I, I respect that. Like as much as we teach, as much as we, like any person that can, that, that has been in and done any of this stuff understands what it takes. And what mm -hmm. you're describing is the same type of patterns that I've seen that work. And I know what also doesn't work. What doesn't mm -hmm. work is saying, go do Scrum when people don't have no clue or don't they don't have the environment <laughs> to do Scrum. Um, and uh, maybe maybe the last word that, you know, uh, to, to leave us with is integrity. I think mm -hmm. I'm going to hold myself a little bit more to integrity uh, and doing the right thing. Sometimes even though if it's, you know, taking less money <laughs> in, <laughs> but, uh, but it goes back to like, really people and uh, i think a lot of times we we do what customers want we do what mm -hmm. we want and we know that's probably not serving anybody long term better so uh, uh thank you and, and thank you. Nelson, just just to, just to close on and to agree with that and to close on that is it right now uh, as software people we have the fate of the world in our hands we can build reliable uh, pieces of equipment uh, and code that flies planes, drives cars, restarts hearts, uh, or we can d focus on dividing things into two week iterations or on tickets moving from left to right. We need to make sure at any given point in time that we understand that the, the, uh, there are a lot of unintended consequences of our faulty work and that we can't accept that malpractice or that laissez-faire attitude anymore. We have to grow up and build some real software.